interesting media world where everything is taped, whether it's needed or not. So, <laughs> just in case. And where it all goes, we don't know. But <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, are you rolling? Shall I? Yeah, come on. I want to. So we're going to talk about democratic education, and uh, of course, feel free to just enter into the discussion whenever you feel moved. But we do have some ground rules I'd like to set before we start. Okay, please sit in your chair and do not move from your chair during this period of time. Okay, if you have something to say, raise your hand. Please don't interrupt me unless you do have an important question. We will have a bathroom break in an hour, but until then. Please stay seated, all right? Wait your turn, please. There will be a test, as a matter of fact, afterwards. But first, I want to say that the content of what I have to say is actually not my content, but it's determined by the governor and the legislature. And at the end of this, we will have a test. And if you don't pass the test, we'll start again. And I'll repeat the content from the governor and the legislature until you get it, all right? Now, this will go on for approximately eight hours. We'll have four, in four hours, we'll have a food break. So even if you're hungry, you'll have to wait, okay? We will have four hours of homework, and you'll turn in your assignments tomorrow when we meet again, <laughs> okay? You get the point. All right, so this is the educational environment in which the public schools are currently functioning. Now, that environment, the public school environment, is set within what we call a democratic environment. That is a country which is run democratically within a world which is actually becoming more and more democratic, strangely enough, despite the uh, political difficulties, democracy is actually uh, spreading. So now the question that I, I want to pose today is why is it that the schools in which we are educating our youth to become citizens of a democracy, why are they run in the manner of a dictatorship? Why are they being run from a top political uh, power structure down through and to the child? And are there any reasonable alternatives to that? The question, of course, is are children, that is, those under 18, people? Or are they not entities? Now, if you'll recall from your American history, in the beginning of this country, there was a democracy for white males. It, landowners. Landowners. <laughs> okay, fine. All right, so white male landowners. Now, eventually, this evolved into where there was actually uh, votes for women, too, white women. Eventually, we allowed people of all races of a certain age. Okay, this is what democracy means. It does mean that a child is not illegally a person. Except, of course, if that child picks up a gun and shoots somebody. And then they can be tried as an adult. Let's say if you're 11 years old and in Florida and you shoot another kid, you're an adult. Right? At 18, you can go into the army, but you can't have a drink. We're a little confused about what children actually are or what they should be, other than that they should not be allowed to operate under the same kinds of conditions that an adult does. That is, they cannot determine whether they can get up from their seat and go pee or what they will learn. Now the question that I want to pose is, is this accurate? Is it true that a child, and let's use, for the, for the purposes of this discussion, let's talk about what we call school age children, and let's call that roughly six to 18. So let's leave aside the developmental issues of a child that's say under 
six years old. It's because that's a, a little bit of a different uh, consideration. So does a child, six to 18, have the capacity to self-regulate? Does the child have the ability to decide reasonably what to do with the time of their life? And what's the result if we give the child that choice? So this is when we talk about democratic education. We're not talking about education within a democratic society where reasonable adults vote on how much money to spend to teach their children under uh, autocratic conditions. What I'm talking about with democratic education is where we recognize the personhood of each individual, and we allow that person, whatever their age, so long as they can act responsibly, to be responsible and to be free. According to your standards, do you define responsible? Well, the, we, can, we can apply standards such as the same standards we, we apply to what we call adults, we get legal standards. Like you can go up to 55 miles an hour, but you can't go over. So that's a responsible person doesn't do that or they pay a fine. So we can apply the same kinds of standards to a, a minor. But in terms of uh, education, this goes a little deeper than following the, the speed limits. It goes to the question of whether every child should have a similar kind of knowledge base. Should every child learn to read? in second and third grade? Should every child learn basic arithmetic in that period of time? Should every child learn algebra at a certain time? Should every child learn American history, where they'll learn about democracy and the fact that they're not actually living under those conditions themselves? So the question of freedom and responsibility also means that the notion of what an educated person is changes. It's not a, a person who's educated based on a standardized view, but a person who is educated in relationship to their own curiosity, drives, and interests. And those drives and interests are then mediated by the relationships that they have in their school, in their homes, in their, in their communities. So I'm asking really for a reflection on what education is about. Now, we know what education has been about, and it has been a top-down kind of curriculum. The more chaotic and you know, agitated, rebellious, and destructive they become. Now, who's creating that? Is it the child that's creating that, or is it me that's creating that? The more space that's given, the more focused and creative they actually become. Isn't that interesting? And you know what? The same thing would be true with us. I challenge that assumption about us that there, there's this lack of free thinking, um, intelligent, problem solving individuals in our culture. I think they actually exist in profusion, maybe not in the majority anymore, in like, in, but there's you know, a small percentage of them that definitely exist out there who went through conventional support. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I would say the reason why the world exists as it does is the lack of those people's ability to move effectively within um, a society that's socialized so negatively. So you're saying those people should go take over the schools and make the schools more effective? Don't you think that the schools themselves are so fundamentally flawed that the only way to do that is just start all over again? Well, that, that, that's a challenge in my uh, son. That, you know, obviously that's one opinion is that the schools are so fundamentally corrupt that the only thing we can do is create another system where um, that's, that's as utopian as we can create. Well, it's ironic that we're sitting in the place that we're sitting having this discussion, you know? Because really, we could be sitting, let's say, at Walmart, trying to decide how to purchase, or should we purchase plasticware or detergents in order to influence Walmart's direction, you see? Or we could say, well, actually, we don't need to shop at Walmart at all. We could actually create a place like this, which is cooperative, in which discourse like this can take place, and create something completely alternative. So this is an interesting question. Where I've come to, I think, in terms of public education is that it's Walmart. 
and whether I buy plasticware or detergent is not going to change Walmart. So what else is there? Do we have to refer to the educational structure in our discussions? Is it, is it always going to be a world that we can only imagine within the framework of what has been? Or can we actually begin to imagine and live something which is completely new? And this is where you come face to face with your own education, your own structures, your own condition, the parameters that we have unconsciously taken on that says, oh, no, I can't do that. So I'm suggesting that still that potential is there, that each of us has the potential to step into something completely new and fresh. It's not going to be found, though, in this area of knowledge and conditioning of information and learning that we've acquired through this system of socialization. So we have to find something else. Also, I think that when you mentioned that there are indeed many people in this society and other society that are flourishing and there are free thinkers, etc. But it's not that it's not clear that that was due to the education that they've had. It might very well be to the resistance to that education. That is to say, they found ways of not allowing that education to constrain themselves. In other words, that the kind of education that they've had is not altogether effective in strangling this curiosity and this freedom of what happened. Very great possibility. At least that one, one of the main conclusions that I've come to in my life with respect to the university, which for me in my early 20s and 30s was essentially a monastery. That's where you went. It's a monastery of the intellect. That's where you went to learn the truth. And you know, from my experience after 30 years, I find that it is a, a, a prison of, of very subtle manipulation, which is very destructive, not only to me, but to other people who are in the university. And that the solution that I'm looking for is to see if something outside of the university can actually occur that has the same original function uh, that the university has had. To very noble one. That it is literally a conviction that it can't be done from the inside. Or at least I don't have the capacity to do it from the inside. I'm too crushed by this force to do it from the inside. And so if I'm to survive and I'm to serve in some measure in a liberating culture, I have to operate outside the university. And it's a, a conclusion I've come to very, very reluctantly about that. Do you believe that it can? I know mean, you sort of hesitate on that it sounds like a new one, but it can be done from the inside. I'm or, saying. Whereas it just takes a concerted effort from a sort of like a subversive effort from the inside. Yeah. You know, that maybe you're just. That most people who would be interested in doing that wouldn't have the will to do it. I don't know that anymore I have the capacity to do it. And that the. That, uh, it's not as if I haven't tried for so many years. And perhaps I haven't done it well, strategically, with sufficient other people, you know, etc., etc. But I find that um, whatever time remains to me, I'm reluctant to use it. Fighting such a battle seems to me to be uh, futile. I'm so curious about your emphasis on public education. That we need to have education in public as opposed to private? Um, that it's actually free? Not necessarily. Um, I would just say that for, for my method of learning is to advocate my learning positions. <laughs> <laughs> I find that if you have a, a singular group of people of like mindedness, that the ability to learn and explore multiple outcomes is extremely limited. Mm -hmm. Unless you have, unless you have challenge to the to to the dominant paradigm, even if it's a positive dominant paradigm, you know the chance for evolution and and meaningful discourse is limited. Uh, I would say that the, you know the fathers of you know modern education and dialectical thought, you know in Greek and Roman times, you know found dialectical discourse or the Tibetans in their 
uh, local um, uh, learning system of debate and counter is is, um, is is drawn from that tradition. And so, if we all came here to learn English, would you start teaching Spanish because we're all too? English? <laughs> no, not, not necessarily. Because I would say, would English be um, diametrically opposed to Spanish? No. I would say if, if someone was was speaking English and you wanted to um, challenge the um, the limits of the discourse, you would use um, words in novel manner. You would use um, conjugation that was perhaps non-traditional. For example, you could rapidly a form of using English outside its traditional confines that challenge the existing paradigm. We are um, having some rustling outside the door. I think we're at the end of our um, time here. I would just like to just say uh, that there is actually uh, an active experiment along some of the lines, not all the lines of what I'm talking about today in Boulder called the Living School. We have um, actually several representatives of the school here. If you'd like to talk, uh, Anna is the director and there's several other people who can identify themselves. Uh, if you'd like to talk to them about what that's uh, about. Um, but it is an attempt to embody actually a learning community of all ages without um, coercion and uh, directed by learners in a democratic manner. So um, if you'd like to learn more about that, I think there's literature, li literature there. And there's also a book about education. Have a child. Right. Right, please uh, feel free to purchase one of those, support your co-op, support the local publishing entity that published that. And um, I, I'd be happy to talk to anybody afterwards as well. But um, thanks for coming and being part of it. Do, do you need these chairs? You can make the chairs right there.